I'm Tracy Jackson, and I am visiting here from Nashville, Tennessee. But as you can see from this lovely 80s driver's license, I was born and raised in Del Dubs here. Very proud of that. And I'm uh, honored to be back here. And thanks so much to Rob and the Family Diaries Institute for having me. I think it's important, we've been talking a lot about stories, for you to know a little bit about my story and what I've been doing the past 25 years since this picture was taken. But I started out in medicine as a surgeon, and then after about a year of internship, I became an anesthesiologist. And then I became a chronic pain physician, trained out at Stanford, and I've been at Vanderbilt for about 10 years. And I came very enthusiastically to Vanderbilt with needles to do epidural steroid injections, and yes, writing a few medications. Uh, and at some point, despite me feeling that I was a pretty smart person that trained it pretty smart, with a lot of smart people, that my patients were not getting better. And in fact, a lot of them were getting a lot worse. Um, they would come to me with a symptom, they'd see another doctor for a second symptom, 10 doctors later, 10 different medications later, just chewed up in the washing machine and spit out. And I honestly had no idea what I was doing wrong. I didn't know what I didn't know. So I went and I became a yoga instructor, I became an acupuncturist, I got board certified in addiction, and gradually last year, I went part-time at Vanderbilt to kind of put all that I've learned together and start these holistic healing retreats. And this is a picture of one of my patients from the retreats in the back of my head. And as much as I hate to admit it publicly with my father in the audience, that he always used to tell me, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And honestly, in the past year, it's been the first time in all of my life being a doctor that I really feel like I get that. And this is how most of the visits with my patients now end. And the sauce for what that is, um, I think is education. And so I want to take this opportunity to just tell you guys what I tell all my patients when they come in. Because I think it's important to know what's going on in your body. If you don't understand why the doctor's telling you to go to physical therapy and do some mindfulness, it just doesn't stick. It just seems like another paternalistic kind of order coming your way. So I start out by saying, look, it does not matter where the pain is coming from. It could be arthritis, it could be amputation, it could be cancer. It all has to go up and be processed in the brain so we know where it is and what to do about it. And the first stop in that brain is what I call the gate. Now you'll hear some people call it the lizard brain. It's not technically the lizard brain, it's more of the bunny rabbit brain. But all animals, the most primitive part of our brain, and the whole part, the whole job of this part of the brain is to scan our environment looking for threats and answer the question, am I safe in the world? That's it. And if the answer to that question is no, for whatever reason, the saber-toothed tiger, chronic pain, toxic childhood, relationships, financial stress, identity issues, whatever, it activates your body's fight or flight system. Right, and fight or flight looks a lot like hitting on high alert, waiting for that tiger. So it looks like anxiety, insomnia, high blood pressure, palpitations, irritable bowel symptoms because adrenaline is the hormone that goes straight to the guts, which is why kids get tummy aches when they get nervous, right? Also, when your fight or flight system is cranked up, it'll turn up the volume on your pain signal. So anything coming in from your environment is going to be hypersensitive to that. And the whole trick of this is your body trying to say, get in the cave. The cave is nice. No tigers, rest, rejuvenate, whole thing. But if we don't listen and that threat persists for whatever reason, then the body will say, uh -huh, really? Panic attack, pain flare, get in the cave. And if it's still just all sorts of the stress just continues and continues, you kind of get forced in the cave, and then the cave doesn't look so nice. The cave starts looking a lot like depression, chronic fatigue, gaining weight and you're not eating anything, like storing, storing stores, storing fat for the battle ahead, and altered immunity, either auto, worsening autoimmune diseases, um, multiple medication intolerances, whatever it is. And if you notice, most of the patients that, that have chronic pain that come into my clinic, they sort of have all these symptoms.
and they feel that they're nuts. They're like, I mean, in some days I'm just fine, and then I have a panic attack, and then have no energy whatsoever. I'm like, what is happening to me? And the issue is it's all a gait issue. So when you have this constellation of symptoms together, it should be a sign that we're not treating individual ailments. We shouldn't be going to 15 different doctors. This is a central nervous system processing disorder. But instead, this is what we do. Give people a medicine for every one of them. You notice on the left, it's all downers for the uppers and then uppers for the downers. And it all sort of turns out the process is ramped up pain. And then you have a big band-aid for pain is, right? And so this is how we are. And people end up maybe having a 10-minute anxiety experience, but then they've got a 12-hour anxiety medicine on board. And everybody just ends up kind of feeling like they're walking through life in a fog. And like Renee Brown said, you can't really selectively numb emotions. If you numb the pain, you're also numbing the joy. And you're like, this is what I saw. This is my patience. The other thing I think is important to understand, and this is the way I describe it, is there's a threshold before that gate gets out of control, right? And let's say that threshold is 100. I just take that number. Most of us start out genetically a little bit behind the A ball for whatever reason, praying to some sort of illness, addiction. Um, and then childhood trauma takes a lot of people kind of up, um, right below the surface. Then maybe a sports injury in high school or college takes it, and then everything feels out of control for a little bit. But we know that if we drink a beer, fall in love, take a vacation, whatever it is, we can get down below that threshold and everything's okay. And most people will tell you a time in their life where they could, they could self-regulate. Sometimes things got out of control, but they knew what they needed to do. Graduation, marriage, and then kids under two, and starting a new job. But you keep it together until there's that thing, that car accident, that assault, that deployment, uh, that divorce, whatever it is. And then you end up way up here. And the things you used to do that always works to get you feeling even again, they don't work anymore. And then what happens is people's brains start to panic. Like, what's going on here? Why is it this working? Am I going to be sick the rest of my life? Go to a doctor, go to a doctor. Nothing's making me better. I can't do things that I normally want to do. I feel a lot of shame. I can't participate with my family the way I used to do, so I'm going to quit participating. And when I do things, I hurt for four days, so I quit doing things. And then it becomes this vicious cycle, and you spiral and spiral all the way up here. And then for some people, the withdrawal from the uppers is more down than it was before, and the withdrawal from the downers is more high. And so people end up with addiction on top of a lot of it. The message from this I want everybody to hear, you are not broken. The brain is not broken when it's doing this. It's resilient. This is exactly what the brain has been trained to do in times of extreme physical and psychological stress. It's trying to keep you safe up here. So just because it spiraled out of control, we know this from the military, we know this from great stories of veterans, great research, that actually the more likely you are to develop PTSD, depression, pain, addiction, it actually just shows that your brain is very sensitive to change. And even though it can spiral in the wrong direction, it just as easily can spiral back the other way. The thing is, we just have to treat the gate. Quit focusing on all the individual symptoms and do things to retrain the brain that you are safe in the world, to, to do soothing things. And when you do them, when you, treat, when you retrain that gate, everything gets better at the same time. All of a sudden, your diabetes, your high blood pressure, your sleep, your pain, your, you don't get sick as often. Weight starts falling off. This is kind of the way it works. And I uh, tell people this kind of picture brain pathways as ruts in the grassy field here. So on the right, the more uh, visible rut there is the one that goes straight to your fight or flight system. You can make a new path at any point. Just turn the steering wheel like five degrees you end up in a whole different part of the farm, right? But if you just do it twice and then give up, your brain's just going to default to what it knows. Right? So in some ways, I say healing is technique agnostic. 
There's not a magic cure that acupuncture is so much better than yoga, is so much better than mindfulness. It's not the way it works. If you don't stick with it, it's not going to help. If you can't afford it, it's not going to help. There are a lot of things that soothe that central nervous system. So you've got to find whatever it takes. And the more you do, and the more often you do it, the faster you make a new breath. And not to give up. If you're up at 250 and you try something, I hear this all the time. Yeah, well, I tried yoga for a month, or I did a 30 day paleo diet, or whatever, and it didn't help. Well, maybe you went from 250 to 180, but you're just not experiencing yet. Just got to kind of keep after it. So there's no quick fix, America. I know we hate that. But it does work. I just tell people to think in terms of six months, two years. Just really stick with it. So, I read all this, but then again, I was like, yeah, but is that really going to work, you know, around people that are not used to this hippie voodoo stuff? I mean, I trained out in California, so I got a little dead stuff in there, but can I apply this in Tennessee and North Carolina? And so I took these 12 people, I called the Big 12 out in the woods about 12 months ago, a little longer, um, and I studied it also scientifically to see that this kind of thing work. And this is what I found. Number one, it does. And the number one primary thing is that everybody who has chronic pain feels such shame and isolation. They're either trying, they don't feel like they do enough, or they feel like they do too much. And at the end of the day, just listening to people and letting them know that they are not human doings, they are human beings worthy of love and belonging, and that's enough. And just starting from that place, you'd be surprised how many people just take an exhale and understand that you care. Then there's mindfulness. I won't belabor the point too much because I know we've uh, had a talk coming up that will incorporate some of this. But somebody once told me anxiety is like living in the wreckage of the future when your car hasn't left the garage. So there's all this going on in our brains and we're thinking of all the terrible things that could happen. But so much of mindfulness is maybe we can't keep the car in the garage all the time, but maybe we can stop it at the stop sign or the end of the road before it's in a flaming heat down the end of the um, freeway, right? So things like self-compassion, self-care, gratitude, all these sorts of things just being present in the moment. That's really the crux of mindfulness and their meditation, whatever, prayer. There are a million ways you can do this. But it's just short-circuiting that pathway towards your fight or flight. Movement is key. Um, and people say a lot about yoga. Well, my picture of yoga was People that look like me, been up in pretzels, downward dogs, planks, things that are completely untenable for anyone with chronic pain. So I pulled all 500 of the other papers that have ever been published to try to see, are there, is there a magic pose or a magic version of what will work? And it turns out it's not. You want a holistic movement strategy. If you just focus on the knee, you miss the fact that maybe your knee is actually what's causing your back to hurt, your posture is all related to that. So you want something that looks at the whole body. So that's why things like yoga, tai chi, aqua therapy, walking, just things that combine movement and meditation are the best. And this is yoga. This is that retreat. That is yoga. And it counts. There you get no extra points for bending in a twist. <laughs> this is yoga and it works just as well. And at the bottom, that's tai chi. And you'd be amazed. Lots of data that these things are very effective. The other thing that's important is creativity and play. Now, some people call this passion and purpose, so that freaks people out. Like, I'm not passionate about my purpose, right? But if you ask people with pain, when was the last time you were happy? Virtually 100% of them at some point will say something that involves being childlike and being outdoors. Um, and this is very key, and we just forget that. So a lot of the things that you hear about that we're doing at Pamela Rose and other sorts of things, art therapy, music therapy, woodworking, all those sorts of things, it's getting back to that sense of wonder and playfulness that we forget when we get stressed out and think we have to be an adult future, everything's going to crash and burn on us face. So this is very important, and this is all scientifically validated in the literature. The other thing is food as medicine. So people get real fired up about their diets, like what's the right anti-inflammatory diet to be? And remember, adrenaline activates the guts and gives people irritable bowel syndrome, right? So if you're focused too much on the diet or you feel guilt and shame that you ate that piece of pizza, it's going to give you bowel symptoms, right? And then you don't know what it is. There's certainly some foods. We know processed sugars, 
things in the center of the grocery store that come in boxes and cans, they generally are not so great for you. I hear people all the time saying, but let me take a supplement, a pill of some B12 or some turmeric or other sorts of things like that. Well, not only do the data not really support that, but it's much better if you can get that supplement in a whole food. And if you're eating a Big Mac and then taking a pill, it's not really the same thing, right? So the key is just whole foods that look like real foods that contain the vitamins and stuff that we need. And it's really not any more complicated than that. The last thing is getting into nature, digital detox. It's very toxic and traumatic, focused on that thing all the time, getting involved in our news cycle and everything. People are now starting to write prescriptions for urban kids and their parents to go into parks instead of writing medications for ADHD, for parental stress. All this kind of stuff is just really important um, and cannot be discounted. People with chronic pain have essentially a version of PTSD from interfacing with the healthcare system. If you have chronic pain, get out of it. Get out of it is my recommendation. And then the last thing is community, and we just had a lovely talk about the power of that, so I won't belabor it. But I do think the science is fascinating. I've been talking about stress as being an awful thing. Stress as being fight or flight, the source of that. There's a wonderful TED talk done by a woman named Kelly McGonigal that actually talks about when you release stress and adrenaline, you also release the cuddle hormone, which is oxytocin. That's why I put a picture of myself and the dog. And that's what seeks us to go out, bond with our friends, bond with our family, seek community, have beneficence, volunteer, redemption stories, all the things that build community resilience. And so I'm really so excited to find that this is happening in my hometown 25 years after I left it. And I thank you so much for letting me come and talk to you guys about it. Thank you.